price chart, I think, is the best guide of what the asset is doing, what its trend is, how it, how people are perceiving it, and where it is versus what you might perceive as fair value. So, okay. you know, you, you notice certain characteristics, like crypto tends to be exponential in price. So you put it on the logarithmic chart, it starts to make sense. You know, you look mm -hmm. at things like copper and lumber, they tend to be mean reverting assets because you they get met by excess supply with high, high prices lead to excess supply. So right now with oil at a hundred bucks, everybody wants to make as much oil as possible. So the price comes down over time. It doesn't happen with crypto because you can't. Right. So you need to understand the structure of markets, where the sentiment is. Is it overly bearish? Like a day like today, it got overly bearish. And so suddenly you start to see a reversal. So these kind of things are interesting. Is Ethereum the superior bet? Why did Raul Paul change his mind about Bitcoin? And what is next in store for cryptocurrency as the world faces Ukraine-Russia crisis? Let's find out all these answers by the man himself, Raul Paul. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, macro investor Raul Paul is back with an interview and he's as bullish as ever on the crypto space and in particular Ethereum. Although Raul has been silent during the last few weeks, he is back and in his latest interview he explains his journey to becoming so bullish on Ethereum and that he has stacked over 90% of his net worth into it and why it's poised to explode over this year and beyond. If you like the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and turn on the post notifications. Let's dive right into the video. I had lived through the financial crisis and predicted it. I had also lived through the European crisis and predicted it and had been in Europe and had to buy a generator and food and get cash out of the bank and keep it at home, right? That's how close we were in Spain to losing our entire banking system. Mm. And as a macro guy, I knew the issue was leverage. And leverage had meant that we had a unique problem, which was there's a layer of collateral and all of this debt is against the collateral. And usually you've got like 30 claims on the same piece of collateral. In fact, the average US Treasury has 32 claims on it, or it did then, may have more now. So therefore, who owns what in an unraveling? You know, who's going to get screwed? And the, so, the, the, the leverage was, uh, you're talking about uh, government or corporate? Or where, where did you see this stockpile of leverage? I, I look at total leverage, financial system leverage, government leverage, um, household leverage, and private sector leverage. Right, so we're at 480 percent of GDP now, whatever the stupid number is. Right, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. But the problem is, is that's a lot of claims on the collateral. Mm -hmm. So, because not everything is collateral in the system, only some things used as collateral. Anyway, so when Lehman went bust, right, everyone's scrambling to find who owns what, and you know that, that happens all the time. So I started trying to start the world's safest bank with a bunch of family offices. Um, I thought, you know, we could start a bank that doesn't use leverage, so then. People can put assets there, their savings there, and realize they're safe because it wasn't safe. People in Cyprus had all of their money taken out by the government. Right. So I'm like, okay, I need to do something about this, and I can do something about it. So I started that journey, and a friend of mine called Emil Woods, who was a subscriber to Global Macro Investor, um, who was running a hedge fund at the time, an ex-Goldman guy, he said, you need to look at Bitcoin. And I'd read a bit about Bitcoin. It's probably 2012, um, and I wrote the first macro piece on Bitcoin, which is, I think, the thing you referred to, yep. which is 2013. I was just like, I saw it and thought, okay, so we've got two things here. One is this asset, Bitcoin, and that's a scarce asset in a digital world, so that's probably interesting. And secondly, we've got blockchain, which is a recorded ownership of everything. Okay, well, that solves the entire financial system, and this could be something useful for the financial system in itself as a new version of gold. Raul Paul gives an insight on his journey from a hedge fund manager into the crypto space and reveals that world financial crisis opened his eyes to a new world without central banks regulation and government intervention. So, okay, so I've been in it, I got out, I was nervous about all of these forking wars and everything going on. I'm like, I don't understand this, let's wait and see. And then I had talked about it a lot, analyzed it, been involved in it, but hadn't been investing it again until 2019, started to stick my toes in again because the, the market had been selling off. I was starting to get comfortable that, yes, that we've got a recession coming. This is going to be a useful tool. And then 2020 comes along 
um, and I was already positioned for a recession. But you know, this opportunity was like, okay, if the central banks are going to print like crazy, then that's the opportunity. So I bought a lot of Bitcoin. I owned, at that point, I was long bonds, gold, dollars, Bitcoin. And then over time, I started charting Bitcoin versus other assets. And I realized its dominance in performance was so extreme that it made no sense to own other assets, even with the fact that Bitcoin can be very volatile and have periods like now where it's down 50%. It's like it makes no sense to own anything else. Paul shares his thoughts that he originally thought Bitcoin would prevail to be the most widely held and best performing crypto asset. However, Paul says big players from the institutional investment industry ultimately convinced him otherwise. Paul said the power of Ethereum to generate network effects combined with its technical capabilities make it the superior bet in the crypto space, mimicking the early adoption of the internet. I was Bitcoin first. Then I started doing the work. I was on Twitter a lot. Um, and people, if I were to ask anything about Ethereum, people would pile onto me. That makes me want to know more. So I start right. digging in. <laughs> Has I the thought, opposite is... reaction. <laughs> and I, I knew what about Ethereum and, you know, but I started properly digging in. And I thought, you know, this is really bloody interesting. The chart looks incredible. The chart versus Bitcoin looks incredible. Um, this makes sense to me. So um, I started switching um, into Ethereum. But my big discovery and why I really started loading up on Ethereum was another chart, which was a understanding that Metcalfe's law was the primary driver of all crypto markets. And in fact, almost all of the tech stocks that we've known today. Right. And once you realize that these are basically networks, and once you realize that crypto are networks where you actually own the network. So Facebook is a great network stock and it works perfectly on a log chart and it's an exponential, does all the things as you imagine. You can value it in Metcalfe's law terms, but the fundamental difference is shareholders and network users are not aligned. The shareholders mm -hmm. make the money, the network users get the utility. Along comes crypto, you ma marry the, the network user with the owner. Okay, now you've got network effects upon network effects. This is like behavioral economics right. manner from like heaven. Religion meets Matt McCaff's law, right? It's like, yeah, uh, it's, it's, now, yeah, it's religion I a, meet, uh, now I'm tribal it's religion, about the thing. <laughs> it's religion meets capitalism. It's basically yes. what it is, right? So that is incredibly powerful. So I start looking at the fact that Bitcoin and Ethereum charts just at different points when they, at the same point in the adoption cycle, were remarkably similar. And then it dawned on me is they're all the bloody same thing. They're mm. all about adoption. So then, so, so if you look at it and if you're honest with yourself, Ethereum, if you think about Metcalfe's law, it's about the number of users and then the kind of connections between the users and the applications built to create those connections. Well, Bitcoin's kind of a one-sided one, which is a bunch of people own it as a store of value, like gold. Nothing wrong with that, but there's not many applications built on it. When you look at Ethereum, it's like, holy shit. I mean, this is like the internet. Right. That moment is like, okay, this is far superior a bet. Um, and so that's why I took that bet. And then I eventually shifted majority into Ethereum and then took other bets in the space to express macro views. The overall space is very valuable, but the opportunity, that ramp, that's right. the single most important, interesting part of network effects. Right. The and the fact effect. that you can own a share of the network so even when the network flattens out and is now worth, I think, $200 trillion for the digital asset space, it's currently $2 trillion. That's 100x in market cap. That's huge. We've never had anything like this before. You know, for me, a lot of people think of money as the primary objective. I actually like houses, as you can tell from the house behind me, <laughs> right? Because this is where I live. This is the quality of life. This is my bank. This is everything. Um, and so I like where I live and how I live. That's why I live in the Cayman Islands. That's why I lived in Spain. They're beautiful places and I live a quality of life. So that has always been my journey. But what I want to do is I always take steps towards the end game. I kind of live in the future always in everything that I do. So I always have a vision of my future self or whether that's future state of financial markets, where I think it's going, whatever it may be, I'm always well ahead. And so I then can look, it's much easier to live in the future and look back and say, how do I get here? 
than stand here today and go, I want to go forward. It's kind of weird. It's a psychology thing. Real Vision CEO Raul Paul also says that Ethereum is set to rally and there are two altcoins popular among investors that may be ready to compete with Ethereum. The macro guru says that a number of influential people whom he considers to be important investors are bullish on decentralized finance or DeFi payment network Terra or Luna and the interoperable blockchain Polkadot or DOT. Paul also shares his 2022 forecast for Ethereum. He says the leading smart contract platform is still the greatest trade in the world. So do you agree with Raul Paul regarding Bitcoin versus Ethereum? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.